So welcome to the final lesson of the season or a semester or whatever terms you're thinking of it in. Sometimes I think of it in television terms and they become episodes and seasons. Sometimes it's semesters. It, it's hard to say. Always, always. It's always really tight on time. You end on a cliffhanger. Yeah, it's, there's a formula to it. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you recognize that. Um, but yeah, change of venue tonight. I think it's a little tight, but I think that was a good call because yeah, yeah, you stepped over into the other sanctuary and it was not a sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we have an oven just adjacent to this. So, um, but yeah, tonight should be good. So last week we talked about Paul and we talked about about like two thirds of his trial. So we talked about the Apostle Paul before. He was first brought before the Sanhedrin, and then he went to Felix, who was the governor of Judea, which is very similar to Jesus' trial when he stood before the Sanhedrin and then before Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. And tonight we're going to look at the next guy who is in charge of Judea and King Agrippa, the name should sound familiar, we're going to talk about, but not read, a very exciting passage that takes up Acts 27. We're going to look at Rome, and we're going to look at things beyond the book of Acts. Sounds like a lot, shouldn't be, and we'll definitely finish up tonight because we're going to finish up tonight, you know, come what may. So, let's open up in prayer and we can get started. Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for everyone who was able to make it out. Thank you that we had a cooler option for the class tonight. And I just pray you'd be with us during this time and help us to round out the book well and walk away with a better understanding of your earliest servants and disciples and that it would inspire us to live out our own Christian lives in similar ways as we try to follow you. So I pray you be with us during this time. Your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You notice it echoes lesson here too? That's pretty cool. Okay. So we're on lesson 13. We're actually just going to jump right in in Acts 26. Acts 26. So if you recall from last week, and we already said a little bit, Paul was... Paul was in the temple when a bunch of Jewish leaders had him arrested, brought up on all sorts of strange charges that he was not guilty of, but he was tried all the same. And when it was clear that the Jewish leaders were going to attempt to just have him killed, he was taken into the custody of Felix, the Roman governor of Judea, for protection. He heard the trial. Felix basically just left Paul sort of free, but in, in prison in some fashion for two years, hoping Paul would bribe him to let him out of prison. And that didn't happen because Paul has no money. And Felix eventually gets called back to Rome because he's an incredibly corrupt leader that the Caesar doesn't like. And then someone named Felix gets put in his place as the governor of Judea. And what Felix is going to do, it, actually, yeah, you need to know this because this starts off right in chapter 26. Felix, this Roman official, still doesn't fully understand what's going on with Paul. He's new to the scene. He's from Rome. So he doesn't understand what this whole Jewish Messiah problem dispute is about. So he finds out the leader Agrippa is in town. So he has Agrippa come. So if you remember, back in the, towards the birth, at the birth of Jesus, you had Agrippa, uh, was it, no, yeah, Agrippa the, the Great, is that what they called him? Yeah. He was the one who had all the young children murdered as he's searching for the Messiah. He eventually dies. The next Agrippa is in line. He's the one who has uh, John killed in the, or James in, he has John the Baptist killed. He has James killed in the early church. He is eventually judged by God 
and killed as well. Now this is Agrippa, the grandson from the one we first met at the birth of Jesus. But they are a Semitic ruling family from Judea. So Festus says, yeah, okay, let's get this guy in. He knows he's sort of Jewish. He knows the Jewish stuff. I don't know what's going on with this Paul guy. Let's bring him in. We'll have them dialogue. Maybe I can get a better understanding of this sect, this group of Messiah people. So all that to say, Acts 26, verse 1. We won't read the whole thing. Then Agrippa said to Paul, they're already talking, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am now accused of the Jews. He's happy he can plead his case, especially because I know, I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nations at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. Paul's going to explain everything to do with his Jewish life and upbringing. We've already seen that. Jump to verse 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me with them that journeyed with me. Paul's going to give his testimony. We've heard this before, his road to Damascus conversion. And then we're going to read a longer stretch, jump to verse 19. He says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, after seeing this vision of Jesus, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem, throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. For, <clears throat> excuse me. for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue to this day, witnessing to both small and great, saying none other than uh, none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus, the Roman official, said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning has made you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king, Agrippa, knows of these things, before whom, I also, uh, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I, a Christian, except for these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice, that's a woman related to the governor, and they sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves saying, this man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. All right, I read a lot of text there. That took a while. Hopefully it was easy enough to follow. So all that text, any opening thoughts, anything that jumped out at you, anything that was confusing or interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Almost persuaded to be a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder. Mm -hmm. Whatever he did appealing to Caesar seemed to make the difference to, to Agrippa. Mm. Right? That if he had not appealed, he would let him go. Yeah. Yeah, so originally Festus would be the one 
trying and deciding Paul's fate. And uh, now that he has a more full understanding of what happened, he, they agree, oh yeah, the, he's done nothing wrong. We, we could have let him go, but he already legally appealed to Caesar. We have to send him to Rome at this point. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a tough situation. You anything else jump out at you with this? <clears throat> this seems a little more reasonable. Yeah. You know, even though the group of guys aren't really great, but your grandson wasn't near as bad as the other two. Yeah. He, he was pretty bad, but not. Mm-hmm. So these, these guys are pretty he's reasonable. Yeah. And he understands the Old Testament scriptures. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so there's a probably a pretty good appeal and pretty good testimony, you know, and uh, almost pretty convincing, too. Yeah, yeah. Kind of makes you wonder if anything happened later, you know? Never know. Um, because it, it's interesting that, so he doesn't become a Christian at this moment, but yeah, you're dealing with the grandson of the guy who was slaughtering children trying to kill the Messiah. And he's at least sitting there going, well, it makes sense, you know, he, he's having a reasonable discussion with him and he finds it somewhat convincing. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, I thought, so we, we skipped over it, but because we've heard it before, Paul uses his personal testimony as part of his witness. And I think that's important when we're thinking about like, you know, it's really easy to talk about stuff like this sitting in church, you know, you're, it's easy to preach biblical stuff, like when you're actually preaching, because that's what they expect you to do. If you start talking about things outside the Bible, you're kind of stepping out of your lane a little bit. But Paul is kind of showing, well, yeah, this is part of his life. This is, his conversion experience was a huge deal, and he uses it a few times with different people as he's trying to tell them who Christ is, what this whole thing is about. He uses personal testimony. Um, <clears throat> also, I thought it was interesting that, so Festus thinks he's crazy. The, the Roman guy just doesn't get what's going on, and fair enough. But when he's addressing Agrippa, he's like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You understand this. It's, it's very reasonable, and Paul presents it as the reasonable, logical outcome of all the Jewish things that he already knew from being raised in Judea. So I think it's interesting that Paul presents the gospel as a reasonable thing, because it's not, one, one he's not arguing with anyone for once in, in the ministry. He's not accusing anyone of anything. There's, no, there's not a lot of heated debate here. And to him, he goes like, hey, I, I know this makes sense to you. And now we don't have a lot of Semitic leaders that we'll probably be talking to on a regular basis. But I think that same principle can apply as we're trying to be a witness to people because there are still things that, and we could explore this or it could just be something to think about. There's probably a lot about the gospel that people already know or get or you can at least say, like, yeah, you understand the world's messed up, right? Like, you know, for some reason people balk at the idea of sin. And it's like, well, you've, you've been outside, right? Like, you've been an awful person at times, right? Like, you, you get this? You, you understand this concept? And that's at least a starting point, because that's sort of things that people can't really easily deny. Um, so there, there's always these points where you can, like, where the, the gospel is actually, it actually makes sense, and you can find those common points, and he was able to do that with Agrippa. And then after that, of course, the way the situation ends, it's more of a conversation than a trial at this point, because they're not the ones deciding his fate anymore. But at this point, he is headed for Rome. So he's still in the region of Judea, sort of, and now he's going to be heading for Rome. <clears throat> All right, so. Unfortunately, for time's sake, we are not going to read Acts 27. And I say unfortunately because it's a really cool chapter, and you should read it 
just for entertainment purposes. Now, it's the Bible. It's for more than entertainment. There's not a ton of, like, the theology that we're looking for for this study. It's one of the coolest. It, somehow, the second to last chapter of the book of Acts, Luke puts in this epic, tragic sea adventure. Because Paul is being sent to Rome with a bunch of other prisoners who are being sent to Rome for similar reasons. And they're about to set sail. It's going to take, should take a, probably a few weeks to, to do their journey. And Paul somehow discerns in the spirit, we shouldn't take off. This is wrong. We need to wait until winter's over. Something's going to go wrong. Of course, they don't listen to this prisoner who's saying, hey, let's not go to Rome. And as they are on their voyage, they get caught in a horrible storm that seems to take several days to pass. There's sheer panic. They are throwing things overboard. They're, they're, they're trying to lighten the ship. The ship's in danger of breaking apart. They, at a certain point, they, they don't know where they're going. Like the, They've gotten all turned around. It's a complete mess to the point uh, where they end up crash landing on an island called Malta. Now, one of the things that I will tell you that come out of it, I'm sure some really good speaker could take Acts 27 and make some really good storms of life application to it. We're not going to do that in the lesson. But Paul is such an incredible example of the peace of God during utter chaos. Everything is looks like it's going to go wrong and he is just at peace trusting God because he knows what God has planned for him he knows he has to go to Rome he knows he has to stand before kings and he's actually able to help the whole group it says be of good cheer which is a ridiculous command in the middle of a hurricane on the Mediterranean Sea and he's able to actually help them do that and he's he's a beacon of God's peace and grace in the middle of a hurricane that is happening that that threatens the lives of the entire crew so do yourself a favor and read that when you have time that's very good okay so if you have your books open I want you to turn to page 122 now I don't usually read something from the book and then ask you for your thoughts But I'm going to do that this time, because this is interesting, and they say it well. I told you, Paul and the prisoners crash land on the Isle of Malta. Page 122, paragraph starts with, The island of Malta lies about 60 miles south of Sicily and around 500 miles west of Crete. The islanders showed the castaways, Paul and his group, unusual kindness and made them feel welcome. Obviously, God was again faithfully working behind the scenes. While warming by the fire uh, the islanders had built, Paul was bitten by a viper. Normally, a viper would bite his victim and then retreat. In Paul's case, the viper did not release its hold, meaning that Paul was severely bitten. God, being faithful to his promise to Paul, protected him. This caused the islanders to conclude that Paul must be a god. Publius, a magistrate on the island, Invited, invited Paul and his companions to his estate. Perhaps he too thought Paul was a god. Publius would not want to pass up an opportunity to entertain and perhaps benefit from a god. Paul enjoyed a little bit of luxury for three days. No doubt he greatly rejoiced in his reprieve God had brought his way. Skip the question. While Paul was st- uh, staying with Publius, God used him to heal the magistrate's father. That led to a healing ministry for all the residents on the island. They responded by honoring Paul and his companions and sending them off three months later with the provisions needed for their trip to Rome. Luke describes the voyage to Rome and made special reference to the ship, which had the sign Castor and Pollux. These names referred to the sons of Zeus and Leda. Castor and Pollux were supposed to bring good luck. Perhaps Luke initially mentioned uh, these gods to contrast the true god who had faithfully protected their voyage. Sometime around February AD 60, Paul finally arrived in Rome. All right. A lot of text again. And it's not the Bible, so I feel kind of weird with that. But 
What do you think about this description? It's an interesting little scene, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah, so he is perfectly fine. And it's another funny little turnaround. Like, um, if you remember when him and Barnab or Sil Barnabas or Silas, they were in a Greek city, and they're preaching and teaching, and people say, like, oh, they're, these are awful, horrible people. And then they see him heal someone, and they go, oh, these are Greek gods, clearly. Let, let's do sacrifices. Like, there's 180. Um, the same thing happens on Malta because this, I guess what the islanders know to be a horrible poisonous viper just jumps out and bites him. And they go, oh, bitten by a viper when he's just getting firewood. This man must be a horrible sinner, you know, cursed by the gods. And then he doesn't die. And they go, oh, oh, no, he's a god. That's okay. That's what's happening here. Uh, there's a quick little turnaround. <clears throat> Oh, I mean, probably they, yeah. It's just because they, they say all 267 persons mm -hmm. um, drew a charge from Paul. Mm -hmm. So it seems like he kind of maybe helped win them over a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there wasn't a division. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, yeah, the relationship between, like, the Roman guard, I guess, does change. Because, of course, Paul is just a prisoner to them at, this, at, at the beginning of the voyage. And they, they treat him normally like a, a prisoner. And then Paul ends up being right at every turn as this situation was going sideways. Um, they wanted to kill the prisoners. That was the thing that they were going to do because they thought, oh, the, the boat's going to go down. We can't let these prisoners escape because that's a, that's a Roman thing. Like the... Uh, the yeah, yeah. If, if you're a Roman guard and you let your prisoners escape, or one of your prisoners escape, you will be put to death. So they would, like, uh, we didn't really cover the Philippian jailer too much, but he was the one who was about to fall on his own sword because he thought the prisoners had escaped, and they didn't, and it all worked out. Who's the centurion? Who was that? Changed your mind? Oh, so Paul changed the guy's mind. Uh, where you at? Yeah. Yeah, where in the book? Hmm. Stand by. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was blanking on the centurion. Like cuz I knew Paul was responsible, I kind of forgot about the the middleman there, yeah. Yeah. One of them, yeah. Yeah, he's going to have a brief time in Rome, but yeah. Yeah, this is one of his last big pushes. I mean, it's definitely one of the last big pushes in the book of Acts for sure. Um yeah. Yeah, no, it's an interesting uh interesting little thing. And, um, yeah, he, they win the favor of the guy who's kind of the Roman official over that little island. And, you know, of course, they, oh, they sent him on his way with everything he needed to, you know, go to his court date. So that's great. But, uh, but I guess it's a thoughtful gesture anyway. Um, 
All right, so they finally get to Rome. It takes them a little bit longer. And interestingly enough, Paul is greeted by a whole you know, small group of Christians at Rome um, because you know, the way the prison systems work, it, it was pretty common for people to come and go. Like they, it, it was usually in Roman prisons, your time in prison, like how well it went was determined by how good your friends were to you. Um, some of the, like the, the gospel commands of Jesus about like, you know, when I was in prison, you, you came to visit me. Uh, it's not just like talking to someone through the glass. It's like you're, if you're in prison, your friends could, would be the ones to bring you food, to bring you extra clothing. Uh, Paul eventually asks for like basically his Bible and some extra stuff. They would basically just make you, the, the Romans would basically just make you survive more or less. And then if you were lucky enough to have good companions in that area, they could bring you some more stuff. So he meets up with a lot of Christians in Rome, they, or they come to meet with him. And it's interesting because when he wrote his letter to Romans in the first chapter, he's talking to the church in Rome and he's saying like, yeah, I, I really hope that I can come and see you soon before I, I, he was going to go to Spain and do a few things. Looks like he, he, he got to see the church at Rome, just probably not how any of them expected it to go. Uh, but yeah, he, he meets Christians very shortly after he gets to Rome. And we're going to see more favor on Paul from these Roman officials. Chapter 28, verse 16. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, uh, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. When they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, they would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause have I called you to see you and speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, uh, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spoke any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it's spoken against. No, no one likes what you're doing. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. When they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spoke the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, Esaias, Isaiah, the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear and not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. When he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. That is how the book of Acts comes to a close. It's an interesting way to close a book, and we'll talk about it. A lot of text there. What do you think? What jumps out at you? What, what do you have questions about? Yeah. Either agree or disagree, but Yeah. Basically, yeah, it almost seems like he has a Roman soldier who's like his sponsor and he's basically on house arrest, but they 
don't really seem to restrict who's coming and going and it's it's about as good of a setup as you can get in that situation i think and yeah is he just on house arrest because just some of them are mad at him because it's like it seems like it has, they're saying that well so with that he's referring to his conversation with Fee, uh, with festus and agrippa where they said like hey if he hadn't appealed to caesar we we probably would have let him go now that we understand what's going on um yeah so his original cause of arrest is this problem in the temple with the when the the jewish leaders were accusing him of things but then it goes to festus they're like hey we would have let you go but you appealed to caesar now he has to await trial by with caesar as the high official who can actually do what he's going to do so this is two years waiting <clears throat> to see caesar yep oh, okay. yep <laughs> yeah yeah, well, they didn't even have email back then, so it, things took a while. Things took a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no matter how long you wait, you're still not going to have the president, like, judge your case, you know. It's a, it's a diff- different setup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else jump out at you? I know there's a lot there. Because mm-hmm. it, it was kind of getting him out of a bad spot. Again, it just keeps reminding me that the Jews are just like their worst enemy, like all the time. With the early church, yeah. Yeah, well, and even, of course, even to the Old Testament as well. Oh, like their own worst enemy? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 God does so much for them. Yeah. And then, and they're cool for it sometimes. Yeah. And Right. And then, and then this same thing, I mean, they just, at this particular time in yeah. history. Yeah, well, fortunately, we, like, we, we don't act that way ever. So, yeah, um, it, it's fortunate they, we got that sorted out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's a shame because it, it, when Festus and Agrippa say, like, oh, yeah, if you hadn't appealed to Caesar, we're tempted to be like, ah, Paul, what were you thinking? Like, maybe, maybe it would have worked out. But if we recall, he appealed to Caesar because when he was under Felix, that, that governor, the Jews were still trying to have another plot to just like, oh, it's, it's cool, we'll just bring him back to Jerusalem, we'll, we'll sort it out amongst ourselves. You know, forget the fact that they had an assassination attempt against him or plot going last time he was in Jerusalem. So like, he, he really did have his hands tied. Appealing to Caesar seemed like his best bet at the time, but yeah. Yeah, anything else with this passage? So no matter where Paul went, he was always the same. Mm. And always found an opportunity to give a witness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, his situation uh, did, did change him and did change his mindset. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's pretty good. That's yeah. Yeah. You can say no longer. Yeah, Paul's a pretty righteous guy. Yeah. Yeah, not bad. Which is really commendable for everything he went through. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he went through, you know, probably four or five lifetimes of somebody else's troubles. Yeah. And uh, so I always feel guilty when you read about him. And uh, I got to stop whining. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of my main notes about Paul was that he's still he's still doing his ministry no matter what situation he's in. Like if there's ever a time where you'd maybe be excused for not doing your missionary work, it's when you're in prison in some capacity. And yeah, Paul just makes he has a good prison situation, like as as good as it gets, I suppose. And uh, he still just makes the most of it, you know. Um, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, we we talked whenever we did about him and Silas being in the jail in Philippi, and like historically, we know what that jail is. There, there's a main central known jail. I think it's Mamertime Prison. And it's basically a pit in the ground. Like that that's basically all it is. They have some chains down there, they they have it locked up, but it's basically just a hole in the ground to throw prisoners into. And yeah, lots of people died. It would, it would be a horrible place to be. Yeah, so no matter the situation, Paul seems to just carry on with his mission of Christ. And that's very commendable. Of course, just putting him in this situation, like where he can be with this Roman soldier who I, I guess has agreed to kind of take him on. I don't know what the, that system's like. You know, God's showing him a lot of grace and still using him during this time. So that, that's interesting. That's good. And also, did you notice most of this section, like, who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jewish leaders again. If he has, if he, you know, the Jewish leaders of whatever synagogues in Rome, that, that's who, who he'd be talking to. If he had any opportunity to be bitter against his own people, it's while he's being held in Rome awaiting appeal to Caesar because of what the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem accused him of, had him arrested of, tried to have him killed on a few occasions. If there's ever a time for him to be like, no, I'm, we're done with this. It would be now, and he's still sticking with his tried and tested formula of he'll talk wherever he goes, he, he talks to the Jews first, and then the Gentiles. And he invites the Jewish leaders to hear everything he has to say and reasons with them. It sounds like some of them probably believed him. You know, it seems like there's some some back and forth, some arguing there, but yeah, he's still doing his, his thing for the Jewish people. Uh, Romans 9, I think we get a really good indication of his heart for the Jewish people because they're his people and he wants them to accept their Messiah. Also, did you notice the verse that he quotes? He, uh, he starts it in verse... The quote actually starts in verse 26, um, where it's the hearing ye shall hear and not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive, that whole thing. You might remember Jesus using this as he's talking to the Jewish leaders, as he's speaking to them in in parables about the kingdom of God and what's the judgment that's coming and salvation that's offered. And he says, yeah, Isaiah spoke well of you guys saying, you know, you'll hear, but you won't understand. You'll see, you won't perceive what's happening. And Paul uses this Right here, Luke has it right at the end of his book, because this isn't quite the end of Paul's life. Luke's choosing where he's doing all these things in the book uh, under the direction of the Spirit. It's ending that way. I think it's pointing to the prophets, but it's probably reminding us of the last important person who used this, this verse. And we'll talk about the ending in a minute. Before we discuss, like, discuss slash speculate why on earth Luke ends the book, why and where and how he does. I want to look beyond Acts a little bit because it'll give us a glimpse into the life of Paul that we don't quite see here. So you can keep a spot here if you want and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. Now that's going to be a little further into your New Testament. If you hit Hebrews, you went too far. All 
Right, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, this is a letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, who we met and talked about earlier in the book of Acts. He was uh, a helper of Paul. Uh, Paul would eventually leave him to pastor the church in Ephesus. So, good man, strong Christian, leader in the early church. Paul is writing him this letter shortly before he's going to die. Okay, so, chapter 4, verse 16. We'll explain this. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So, let's... Okay, so I'll tell you what's, what people think is happening based on these verses. It's fuzzy. It's a little unclear because this is just, we're looking at one side of a personal letter. It's like hearing one side of a phone call. What they think happened based on the dates that they know all this took place. Some scholars think that as we leave Paul in the book of Acts waiting for trial, that he goes to trial and is acquitted based on verses like this. Because what he's saying in verse 16, he says, at my first answer, it's the Greek apologia, like his first, um, his first defense. At my first defense, no one stood, they, they, they believe he's talking about a trial with Caesar. That when he was at his first defense, no one was with him, but Jesus was with him, strengthened him, saved him out of the mouth of lions, which could be a good biblical metaphor based on the book of Daniel, or could be the literal, he wasn't thrown to the lions. So some people think that he actually won his appeal to Caesar, continued ministry in Rome, and then was rearrested, tried, convicted, and then put to death. Okay, um, I'm a little fuzzy on it. I understand that there are plenty of reasons that people think these things, also because of the dates that they know certain things are happening at. Uh, we know Paul died anywhere between 66 and 60, I would say 68, 67, somewhere in there. I'd probably say 67, but it's, it's debatable. Um, yeah, yeah, someone's cheating, yeah. No. Um, I did too until I saw you point to the book. I was like, wow, okay, good. Yeah, early church history, nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so he died somewhere in that range based on when they knew, like, they know when these people took over, they know how long these trips took. They think there's, there's too much of a gap and then based on certain evidences, certain testimony of the later early church, like outside the Bible, uh, some people think that's what happened. Because as he's writing to Timothy here, uh, we see he's, he knows he's about to lose his life. First uh, Timothy, yeah, so still in chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept my faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day not me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. And he's, he's asking Timothy to come quickly to where he is, to, to minister to him, to bring him some stuff, to be with him at the end. So that, that also doesn't look like the situation we find him in at the end of Acts. Now maybe there's a time between like those two years where he's ministering and like an actual conviction, you know, it's like even, even today, it takes, if someone is convict, given the death sentence, it will take years and years for that to actually follow through. I'm sure it's a little swifter in ancient Rome, but yeah, so, so we don't know exactly what's going on, but no, no, you did not get as many appeals back then. Um, and we, uh, we can look in the book, probably right around where Dave was uh, checking out, page 125. 
uh, there's a paragraph that begins with scholars debate what happened to Paul after the events written in Acts. Clearly, Paul was released and continued his gospel ministry. Many scholars refer to Paul's post-Roman imprisonment ministry as the fourth missionary journey. During this time, he wrote 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. During this last imprisonment, the Roman government held Paul as a prisoner awaiting death, the verses from 2 Timothy we just read. 2 Timothy then was Paul's last epistle. Tradition suggests that the Roman government executed Paul by decapitation around 67 or 68. While Paul was in prison awaiting death, he wrote a personal plea to Timothy. Okay. So that is what we think, what we know, sort of, about the end of Paul's life. The Bible doesn't record his death. Church tradition talks about it from pretty early on. It seems fairly reliable. And also we know Paul was a Roman citizen and decapitation was a pretty standard means of execution for Roman citizens. Uh, a citizen couldn't be crucified or anything like that. That was for the, the non-citizens of Rome. So that was, the decapitation was the quick, merciful death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so we believe that's what happened to Paul. Yeah, it seems like some people talk about it as, as a fourth missionary journey after what they ex suspect was a release after his first appeal. It's hard to say. It seems like, if anything, he probably ministered in Rome up until the end. Uh, again, it's not in the Bible, but church tradition puts Paul and Peter in Rome at a certain time. And that tradition starts really early. So I'm... I don't know, when, when you have a really early tradition that doesn't affect anything other than like geographical data, I'm tempted to believe it when there's, there doesn't seem to be much personal reason for them to lie, like for anyone to, to miswrite something. It seems like Paul and Peter ministered together at the church at Rome towards the end of his life. And we know Paul is also, see, again, according to church tradition, he, he is executed in Rome. Peter is also executed in Rome. It, it seems to fit. We know they both die right around the same time within a, a short span. Nero, yes. Emperor Nero. Yeah. Um, yeah, he has both of them executed at slightly different times, but probably within the year uh, as he is on his rampage blaming Christians for just about anything he can he can get his hands on because his his time was not going well as emperor by that stage of the game. So, that's what we assume the end of Paul's life looks like. Now, the ending of the book of Acts. We already read it. I mean, if you need to flip back there, that's fine. Acts 28. The question that I have, why do you think Luke... Why do you think the Spirit inspired Luke to end it where and how he did? Like, what do you make of an ending like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, we know how Paul's life ends. Um, and the book of Acts doesn't, it doesn't take you that far. It doesn't take you there. Uh, there could be a handful of reasons for that. Um, hmm? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, so some. Does Timothy follow his lead? How so? Please don't you know, take her, pretty much take her, right? Get her to die. Continue on with his journey, right? 
So, uh, so Timothy is left in Ephesus at a church there. So Timothy doesn't so much as take over in Paul's evangelistic ministry, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the book of Timothy, both First and Second Timothy, are interesting. It's like Paul writing a letter to his young protege pastor and helping him along in how to minister to the church in Ephesus. So yeah, he doesn't take over in an evangelistic way, but he's definitely like Paul's spiritual son, and Paul gives him a lot of, you know, biblical advice on on how to lead the people there. Yeah. Yeah, so I take the approach with this, uh, similar to what was said, because some people uh, will conclude that, oh, this ends with Paul in prison, so that's when Luke finished writing it. Like, if he had known about Paul's death, he would have written about Paul's death. One, I would, I would challenge those people to question how long they think it took to write this book. Um, under the guidance of the Spirit, it's incredibly well thought out. One, it takes a long time to write and produce text in the ancient world, just for starters. It takes a lot of money to produce text like this in the ancient world. We often don't think of that. It wasn't just pen and paper. It wasn't that simple of a process. Clearly, there's a lot. We talked about all the parallels with the ministry of Jesus, uh, both with Peter and Paul. It's clearly thoughtfully woven together. And also just the idea that he could only write exactly what he knew was, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. Um, yeah, it seems like, in the same, like, the thing I've been repeating ad nauseum throughout this series is the early church looked like Jesus. And we saw that all throughout the church, we saw Jesus identify, like almost identified with his people. And especially as we watched the ministry of Paul, the life of Paul, he's going just like Jesus, bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. He goes to the Sanhedrin. He gets punted up to, this, to a Roman governor. Paul eventually... We know he'll have to appeal to Caesar, but we never see it, because I, I almost think that breaks the pattern of Jesus, and uh, the Spirit's really trying to show us Paul looking like Jesus. And also, it's the idea of... It, Acts is almost like the continued ministry of Jesus through his people. And the way the book ends, it's just this open-ended, ongoing, and the Word of God is going forward, um, it almost seems like kind of the final, okay, once again, the Jews aren't having this. It's going to the Gentiles, and it's going. Under the power of the Spirit, the gospel is going. It's conquering. It's doing what it's intended to do. And I think in the same way that like we're invited to see, oh, well, Peter, man, he, he looks like Jesus, and Paul, he looks like Jesus. Well, and I guess, well, and I'm a, I'm a Christian, too. I'm, I'm like one of these disciples. I I need to look like Jesus, and the gospel also just just keeps going out. Like there's, you kind of left this at like a, a to, to be continued that you never plan on finishing, and you just, or like when, when the hero rides off into the sunset, and you, those endings are meant to be like, oh yeah, I know this chapter's closing, but wh what, what fun are they going to get into next time, you know? And it's kind of this idea of, the story is just waiting to, to continue all in the, the lives of the rest of the Christians. Because whenever Luke wrote this and whenever it got circulated, it would have been in times of incredible hardship for the church. The church would still be young. You'd probably still be under the tyranny of Nero or one of the other persecutions that would come throughout the centuries. And that's who he wrote it to, and he wanted them to even at the very last pages, the disciple is bound, the word of God is not. And it's going to keep going forward and conquering and doing the things that the cross intended for it to do. It sounds like he ended it the same way he started it. Because your whole message with all these weeks yeah. has been the continuing of God's word. Mm -hmm. But you've said like a zillion times. Yeah. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, it's a powerful, and Luke was doing that all throughout when he would end a section with like, and the word of God prevailed and the church grew by the, you know, he's kind of giving you these constant updates of the ministry. And at the end, it just, it's going off into the sunset. We're just kind of waiting for the, like to almost calling on us to pick up the mantle, the next, the next leg, the next journey, the next this or that. Um, yeah, so I think it, there's always a chance it could seem abrupt the way he ends it, but I think it's actually a really powerful, intentional idea behind it. Uh, so why don't we look in the book at, you know what, I didn't write down what page it's on, but it's, it's the conclusion. 126? Okay. <laughs> yeah. The scholar will know. Um, Okay, so it starts with, Acts illustrates the birth and growth of God's church and how Jesus preserves, protects, prospers, and provides for his church. The fiercest opposition could not hinder the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Luke demonstrated time after time that Jewish, Gentile, political, and even demonic opposition could not impede the power of the gospel. The gospel uh, penetrated and broke down all ethnic, social, and economic barriers. God even used the pagan Roman Empire to promote the gospel. Truly, Jesus' words in Matthew 16 were fulfilled. I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Acts clearly demonstrates that the church penetrated into the very strongholds of hell and prevailed. As long as the church is true to God's word, relies on the empowering ministry of the Spirit, the church will continue to penetrate the forces of darkness. Paul wrote, The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Now, we are right on the edge of our time here. Um, I would encourage you to look at the making it personal stuff. Some of them seem like they could be like ah oh, yeah, kind of silly cheesy question maybe i filled them out this time i usually just kind of like look at them see what they want you to consider and run from there uh when i look back at all the 13 plus weeks that we've had um yeah i think there's a lot of really good questions in here um so like what evidence of god's faithfulness and care for his church, do you see an axe? I think that's an easy one, but worth thinking about. What aspects of God's faithfulness in Acts endure and apply to his relationship with us today? I think what we were just talking about with the gospel can be a really good, really powerful promise. Um, how has the study of Acts helped you think more clearly about the church? How has the study changed your thinking about being a witness? What have you learned from Acts that will help you be a better church member? That's a scary question, right? Jeez. Um, But yeah, that was the book of Acts, or most of it at least. Um, Yeah, it's a good, I would say fairly exciting run-up, like runner-up to the gospel stories. You know, it really just takes what Jesus was doing and fans it out in a hundred different directions as the church grows and spreads under the power of the spirit and that was the point like jesus says tells them in the book of john like it's good that i that i go because then the spirit will come and instead of just having me with you you'll have the spirit within you and you, you can all go out and be the church the the people of god that he died to allow us to be so yeah no i think uh it's a it's a helpful study. The book did had some had some very good insights and acts, of course. Part of the Bible has some good insights, I would say, to say the least. So, um, yeah. Any any last thoughts or questions or anything like that? That's a great question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where it's going to go from here. Uh, I'll have to see what materials available. Um, the only, like, the, we don't have another narrative book that follows up this. Like, we went from the Gospels are narrative, we went into Acts, which is narrative. Uh, we've really exclusively been in narrative, haven't we? Like, yeah, with 
Judges, Samuel, that, all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, of course, we could look at the writings of Paul. We could look at some of his letters. We could go totally different directions. I've had several requests for revelation. Um, yeah, the, it's a 22-chapter book to cover in 13 weeks. I feel like I would at least need three years to cover the prophetic material in the Old Testament to help us understand the book of Revelation, and I, I, don't, I don't know. So I have, I have no idea where we're going to go with that. We'll uh, see what they have available, give it some thought, and let you know as soon as I'd know. Um, Hmm. Hmm. I'm sure some. I'm sure some thoughtful scholar put that together. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some of the earliest church fathers, like one or two generations away from the apostles, uh, you, you can find in church history some of their letters to some of the same churches that we have from the apostles, which is cool. I, I always forget some of the names, but someone who is like a disciple of John wrote to like the Corinthian church, and it sounds like they, they still had quite a few problems even 40, 50 years later. Um, but yeah, you can trace the, the history of some of them, but I, yeah, I don't. I'd like to think some thoughtful scholar put all that into a helpful package for us, but I'm not sure. Yeah. That'd be a long read, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, any, uh, anything else? <laughs> What's up? Oh, yeah, forgive them for they know not what they do, right. yeah. So, so Paul says here, I don't have my glasses, um, he doesn't leave the church. But all yeah. men forsook me, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Yeah. Reminded me exactly what yeah. 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 all the pastors that I've been 
you know, with or through or, or that are yet to come. If you want a good church, then that good church is one that preaches the gospel. Sure. Um, and, and this, I think this explains it just better probably than anyone because it, it, it just comes right out and says that uh, the church will continue to penetrate the forces of God and it's because the gospel of Christ is the power of God for salvation. So mm-hmm. if it's not being preached, if the gospel is sure. not being preached, then you're at the wrong church. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. All right. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. I think that was a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll see what happens. Uh, yeah. No. Thank you. I think this was a good study. Good look at the earliest church, and yeah, there's a lot that we can take from it because we are in the vein of church who. Just simple people who believe the scriptures, follow Christ, our our hope is in the same gospel, the same death, resurrection. So, yeah, while things are a little bit different today than in the book of Acts, uh, there's a lot of good things that we can take from it, a lot of things we can hope for, and a lot of stuff that should bring us peace, that no matter what's going on, we can still serve Christ no matter what's happening. The word of God will prevail, and we can still look like Jesus 2,000 years removed as his followers, and that's, that's how, how the gospel gets spread, through the word, through the spirit-empowered believers. So, yeah, yeah, this is a good study. So why don't we close in prayer? Lord, I thank you for... Uh, this whole time that we're able to study your word, uh, study this book, the, the continuation of your gospel ministry through the Spirit, through the earliest believers. I pray we would draw uh, some sort of comfort and inspiration and conviction, if need be, about uh, living in true pursuit of you and your mission to spread the gospel, to uh, be witnesses and just to be sanctified, to, to look more and more like Jesus as uh, our time of faith continues, as, as, we, as we are Christians longer and longer that we would look more and more like you. So uh, I thank you for this study. I pray uh, it would continue to impact us going forward, and I pray that you'd be with us. Bring us back next season to learn more about what you've said. Your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.